Hello everybody, I'm Misa Narrates. This is my digital space, I hope you'll enjoy. And again, I figure we're just gonna keep it at I hope you'll enjoy because these topics, such as cultural appropriation, specifically that of Costa Tich, they're not exactly the most enjoyable. But we're gonna do our best to get through all of this. I've got my laptop to my right, and we're just gonna unpack some of the things that I've seen online, some of the things that I feel need a little bit of clarification and keep it moving from there. So. If you do not know by now, Costa Titch is a rapper who is doing very well in South Africa's hip hop space. He is a talented young man. According to people that know him, he's actually a kind hearted and sweet young man. However, because I am neither his friend nor particularly a super mega fan that's in his fan club, I can't speak on his character as an individual. All I can speak on is what has been presented, okay? Okay, so let that be our point of departure. For me, as I look at him, when he came out, and I think the first song that I really got to see of his, and the first time I saw that he was definitely having a moment, was Galagat, okay? Now, I have always maintained, it has always been something that I truly believe. There is never a time where it's okay for white folks to wear dreadlocks. And that was going to be our point of departure. And the reason being, black folks are not allowed to wear a hairstyle that is indigenous to us in peace. Yes, we do wear it. You know, yes, we do lock our hair, etc., etc. Yes, you see a lot of new conversation around naturalness or being natural or how dreadlocks shouldn't be indicative of criminality or of uncleanliness but even with that movement even with that movement black folks are not able to wear their hair in dreadlocks in peace which means that we can't go to work with our dreadlocks without running the risk of facing discrimination. We cannot send our children to school in dreadlocks without running the risk that they too will experience discrimination and sometimes, in my opinion, just like inappropriate contact. For example, I refer back to a video that went viral of a young wrestler in the United States, African American, whose hair was cut off moments before a match because his hairstyle was deemed unfit unfit for him to be able to play. That is our history. And that's that, that's just a recent occurrence, something quick, you know? So I find it very offensive and it has been repeated multiple times that there is no place for white individuals to wear dreadlocks <clears throat> if black folk who originated the style who are most commonly associated with the style, because that is our style, if we are not able to wear our hair in peace, there is no reason for a white individual to adorn themselves or adopt that hairstyle. Particularly in this instance, because there is a movement of people that will say, well, you know, Rastafarians dreadlock their hair, and, and, and so what are you saying that white people can't be Rastafarians? Of course not. But if... You're about it, be about it. And in this instance with Costa Titch and with, you know, um, other, other rappers in our hip hop communities, that is not the case. They're not Rastafarians. They don't have a, a religious or spiritual connection that they have used to quantify why they've chosen that hairstyle. And we've talked about this. So I'm not gonna belabor that part alone. That part we will actually get to at the end of this video. People asked, how is what Costa is doing appropriation? Is it not appreciation, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when the, when the conversation started, let's say today that I'm filming, it's a Thursday. When that conversation started, I believe it was a Tuesday. And on that day, there was just a lot of back and forth. Is it not, you know, appreciation of Zulu cultures, of African cultures? Is it not just like is it is it is it not you know out of malice he's not doing it out of malice do i think that costa Tich is a malicious individual that doesn't like us and that wants to degrade us no 
And I think when we have the conversation about what cultural appropriation is and how perhaps he is feeding into it, we need to remember the fact that there is no assassination of his character as a human being. We are critiquing his presentation as a musician and the profiteering thereof that is being enabled by his presentation. So, you know, a lot of folks were like, well, the dancing we have to allow because, you know, he was a dancer. Of course, of course. But I think something that's really important to remember, even if we say we have to allow the dance, uh, uh, the style of dance, the fact that he dances really well, A, for context, he was a backup dancer. I expect for him to dance very well. That That's his career. He worked really hard at being able to, 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 move in that way. So I'm never going to take that from him. But I think the part that we're forgetting, right, is that hip hop is explicitly black. It's explicitly black. It is developed. It is curated. It is, it is everything. It is black. It is blackness and hip hop is almost interchangeable, right? So because of that, it's also very dangerous when we start to see white individuals being able to adorn the, the, the visual representations of hip hop and be able then to succeed and propel their careers in ways that black folks or black musicians are not allowed the space to do, right? So that, that really is something to remember whenever we talk about cultural appropriation within the space of hip hop, okay? Now, this was on Tuesday. Is this appreciation? Is it not just that, like, we should get over it? This, there's, there's nothing untoward about the behavior. And then on Wednesday, I believe, an interview came to, 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 to the timeline. We, we got a clip of an interview talking about where he spoke on, you know, how he makes his music, how he writes his lyrics, how he gets his inspiration for the lyrics, etc., etc. If this were an instance of appreciation. I would have expected to hear something like, you know, certain things just sound better in Vernac. English doesn't make the message land enough. If he had said that, or something along those lines, I could have said, okay, this is, this is appreciation. Maybe he's appreciating in a way that I'm just not connecting with, but you know, that is the honest to God truth. Sometimes you gotta hear it in Vernac for it to land right, you know? Unless, unless you nice time, you gotta hear it in Vernac. Don't short, don't, what, what in English you would say, don't, don't cheat us of a nice time. Mm, I think that's the closest, the closest way I can, I can, I can translate it. But it doesn't sound right in English. So if he had said, you know, my lyrics sometimes just don't land the way that I want them to or don't have the impact that I want them to in English, so I choose, you know, local languages instead, I would have understood that to be appreciation. If he had perhaps said, um, I live in South Africa and the majority of individuals speak local languages that are not English and that are not Afrikaans. So I felt it important to communicate with them, to include them in my musical journey. If he had said that, I would say, okay, appreciation. Instead, what he said was this. Hey, here's my structure. I want to say this in Zulu and then they'll translate it for me in the best way possible for the song you know and yeah so that's why also like when i do uh vernac lyrics mm -hmm. it sounds believable because the pronunciation is not hard for yeah. me you yeah. get what i'm trying to say so i'm um, i generally I've, if my friends are having a conversation in front of me and speaking in zulu i'll know what they're talking about mm -hmm. do you get what i'm saying yeah. yeah it's just i didn't ever like study it or didn't grow up with it so but it's so crazy what music can actually do you can learn a language that's what's crazy it's what's crazy because i mean like even now i mean most people only know in kalagata right the amount of music i have now outside of that like in the archives mm -hmm. it's crazy bro and it's even getting to the point now like this funny enough i wrote one song via google translate <laughs> for real <laughs> so do you feel like because you speak different languages, uh, not not fully, but you know you rap in the different languages yeah. that you can kind of appeal to a different part of the market that other rappers maybe can't. If anything, when it pertains to like white artists, yeah, yeah. for real, like, I mean, I even have some songs now with like Afrikaans lyrics in them, you know. Mm -hmm. wow. 
yeah, it's just a matter of getting everyone involved. <laughs> bro, like we live in South Africa, make South African shit mm-hmm. for real. And there's like it's actually weird, man. There's a lot of like um African artists that like I'm actually friends with that can speak like Zulu, Swati, all these things mm-hmm. like fluently, bro. Like it's their their mother tongue, you know, it's like the first language. They can speak it fluently but they rap in English. You know, and it's like not using their abilities. You know okay, if you want to blow up internationally, go for it, bro. Like keep pushing, like I'll support you hundred percent. But if you're trying to blow up in South Africa, like let's face face facts and realize that like look at anyone that besides nasty C. Besides nasty yeah, you know, Nasty C He's hit that, that bro. bro, like, and that's why I respect him Like, he hit that sweet spot, you know And it took off But majority of the artists in South Africa Like, legit, like You, you gotta really, like, relate to the masses, you know So for me Based on what you've just watched What I picked up was You are writing these lyrics Without really understanding the language yourself or caring to understand or caring to learn, he is approximately 24, 25 years old. I was born and raised in the United States. His biographies online say that he was born and raised in South Africa. There is no excuse if, you know, the local languages are as benevolent and as endearing to you as as possible. There is no excuse to not be fluent by now. What is the excuse? And then to make matters worse, you are turning to Google Translate for information. Google Translate that was not programmed by folks of color that will literally give you a direct translation without care for grammar. With a, and that's not just for South African languages. It's for everybody. I remember when I was a French student, my teacher was very, very clear. If you use Google Translate, I will know. And by the time I could speak French fluently, I could tell the difference between the French that I knew I was supposed to be using that I had learned because someone had taught me and the French that I got from Google Translate. So it's the callousness. It's the callousness that makes it impossible to believe that this is just from an endearing and benevolent place, that this is from an appreciative place. So now that I've concluded that this isn't striking me as cultural appreciation, the only other part, the, the other side of the spectrum is appropriation, right? And we always like to assume that appropriation is this big, terrible, ugly, and it's covert, and, you know, they're a terrible, evil person if they do it. No. No. It's just a little bit absent-minded. And it's not even all just him. Let's complete, let's actually be honest about something else, right? It's not just him. It's the fact that He can behave this way. He can present himself this way. He can emulate us. He can emulate blackness. He can adorn it on himself like a cloak and enter into general society, enter into corporate, enter into creative spaces, enter into basically everywhere and be accepted without critique without us being able to say, "Mm, I don't know if this is, you know, all together. It's the fact that, granted, he is a talented individual. He is, however, not in a league of his own for the fact that he is still a freshman as well and acknowledges that for himself. Yet he is able to land certain deals in a way that his equally talented peers are not allowed a seat at the table, which makes you wonder why. So is it appropriation or is it appreciation? It is because it is because he is 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 contributed to his work is contributed to by our culture, our languages, our visual presentations. It is because of that that make him the superstar that he is from a package perspective. Because the, he knows this as well. You can't just say, I'm going to put out music and that's going to be it. It's from the music to the movement to the visual presentation to the conversation to the way that your fan bases are interacting, who your fan bases are. There's more to making a star than just a song. He knows that, I know that. If you're watching this from the music industry, you know that too. But the question then becomes, in making him a star and using elements of 
urban culture, urban culture that are not his culture, hip hop culture that is black and subsequently not his culture. In doing so, he is able to amass access and wealth that his peers who are black and who are equally talented are not able to access. And the question becomes, why? That's a secondary question. Why is that? Why is that? And what was disappointing, and I think I'm going to cut this off here, what was disappointing more especially was that he questioned why African artists who can speak their mother tongues choose not to make music in Renek. On top of that, the discourse on Twitter was, I find it very laughable that we are tweeting in English, we are upset in English, and yet we don't consider this cultural appropriation. And I, I'm, I'm gonna take it here because I know that somebody, if not in this comment section, is gonna send this to their friend you know, on the side and be like, well, who is this girl talking with the wig on her head? There's going to be conversation about, well, black women wear weaves and wigs, et cetera, et cetera. Why is that not cultural appropriation? Let me tell you why, in case all of our thesis that BA kids have been giving you guys on Twitter have just you know gone over your head or gone down your back like water over a duck. It is because A, English was served to people who are black or who are in their opinion, in colonizers opinion, non-white, English was served at the barrel of a gun and by way of the Bible. So, either you spoke English or you faced sudden death. That is our history. That is our history. So, you cannot conflate black folk or any folk of color speaking English and noting the fact that so-and-so is being a little bit appropriative with our culture and then say, well, that's reverse the reverse of that would be you speaking in English. No, I do not speak English because I want to. I speak English because it was whipped into one of my bloodline. Are we clear? You speak English because somebody whipped it into your family's bloodline. Your family's bloodline, your country's history, whatever the case. You don't speak English by accident. You speak English by design. It was a social design. Point A. Point B. There is a distinct difference between having had no historical choice but to assimilate in order to access a decent human experience comparing that to an individual who did not have structural impediments to growth due to the fact that they were white and white was right. If you were white, that is not to say that you are incapable of experiencing hardship and struggle. That is a fallacy. It is, however, to say that systems were set up in order for you to succeed from longer than we can count in a way that black folk cannot say the same. So the reason why me wearing a wig and speaking to you in English is not cultural appropriation is because this, what you're seeing here, is assimilation. Being a black woman with Afro hair is a terrible, ugly thing that warrants you to be left to the wayside and not allowed to develop. That is what the white world, that is what colonization would have me believe. Thankfully, I did not believe that. And thankfully, I had a mother that did not believe that. But unfortunately, I cannot say the same thing for every black woman or every black person. And someone mentioned, you know, Costa's parents weren't necessarily involved with, with, with apartheid. Be that as it may be, whether that be true, I, I don't know. I, I would like to believe they weren't, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an unfortunate element of our history that it's possible that anybody could be involved, you know, with, with being on a side that was against human decency. Anybody could be involved. It was the law of the time. 
However, even if his father was Bears Nodia, even if his mother was Helen Joseph, even if, it doesn't negate that he has privilege as a white individual. And as such, to adorn or to use African cultures as adornments, accessories, as elements instead of as what you truly are, it's appropriation, it's appropriative. And how negative or how malicious it is is obviously dependent on the individual. But let us not fall into the trap of not feeling comfortable with acknowledging that this thing is happening. There's a little bit of appropriation here. Let's not fall into the trap of saying we can't say nothing because the song slaps. No. I don't think Costa is inherently evil. I don't think he's a bad dude. I think he's the kind of guy that would shake your hand and say, hey, how you doing? Hey, a guy with good manners based on what everybody has shared about him, what his friends say about him, how lovely an individual people speak on, speak, you know, say about his character. But this is one moment where he, he has an oversight. And it's an oversight that is borderline grave. And to enable it without critiquing it, without interrogating it, without calling a thing a thing, to ask that folks not be offended is unfair. And if you don't think it is, perhaps revisit what I've said in this video and consider where it might be in your opinion okay for us to acknowledge, where and when it would be okay for us to acknowledge when something just is not fair from a cultural appropriation perspective. And that's all I wanna say on this for now. We can have a conversation in the comments. Remember, I like to keep things respectful and I like for people to watch their mouths when they're in my comment section. But there is, there is merit for a conversation here and it's okay to have a conversation. And having that conversation does not mean that we hate him, that we don't want to see him succeed. It just means that we're acknowledging something that we see is not fair and we would like to be able to find a resolve, whatever that resolve might be. So to close, I'm Issa Narrates. This is my digital space. If you've stuck through this far, I'm quite sure you've enjoyed.